this memory, it was about the House of Flowers. The summer after she turned eight, she spent a lot of time across the street at her best friend's house. That day was like any other that late August. They had played school and old ladies and run around outside kicking gates open, pretending to be Charlie's angels. They couldn't roller skate because skates were broken. They tried skating by sharing, each with a skate on one foot. Their arms wound around each other's shoulders, but it hadn't worked. Her friend was more coordinated and ran out of patience with her when she'd lost her balance and brought them both down. The girls were bored and weary of each other's company. They could feel the dark shadow that was the beginning of the school year creeping up on them. She went to a private church school in another city, and she went to the public school just down the street. They lay on the floor of her friend's living room, moodily staring up at the ceiling. Sullen and withdrawn, they were both keenly aware that the long summer days of freedom were coming to an end. His older sister was supposed to be babysitting them, but the teenager had run off to see her boyfriend behind their mother's back. Across the street, her own house, with all of her Barbies and books and stuffed animals, was empty. Her mother was several weeks into a stained glass workshop. She was supposed to stay put at King's until she got home. She wished her mother would come home. They began bickering over what to do next. It was blazing hot, and playing outside was no good this late in the afternoon. King was listless and rejected every game she suggested. She was sick of being stuck here day after day. Do you even want to play anything, she asked, exasperated. You're bossy. We don't always have to do what you want to do, snapped at her. My mother told me I shouldn't let you boss me around so much. She was stunned. Bossy? If she didn't suggest anything, they'd never play at all. If she'd had the vocabulary at that age, she would have said that was a cipher. Third daughter in a regimentally strict household, she had the will and personality of an empty vessel. Later in life, she'd wonder if poor King had ever been allowed an idea of her own. But at that moment, she didn't know what to say, and so she jumped up and announced that she was leaving. You can't leave, cried indignantly. You're not allowed to leave till your mother gets home. You have to stay here. You're going to get busted. She turned the doorknob and looked back over her shoulder. Your sister's not supposed to leave us alone. She slammed the door shut behind her. I'm telling my mom. The window was open and she heard her friend shout, You're not allowed to slam the door. I'm telling my mother on you. As she walked away, she could hear the shouting continue. I hate playing with you. My mother doesn't even like you. She hates having you here. Hot tears sprang to her eyes as she marched across the street. Her heart pounded hard and fast in her chest. Her face red with shame. A grown-up didn't like her. How mortifying. It was one thing to hear that your friend didn't like you. But an adult? That stung. She always felt strangely foreign and unwelcome in her best friend's house. Kicked out at 5 p.m. if they happened to be playing there. Never invited to spend the night. Although Karen was allowed to stay overnight at her own house every once in a great while. Those visits were doled out sparingly. In later years, she would wonder that she had ever been allowed over to her house at all. None of this made any sense to her at the time. She didn't understand why every other day of the week they were allowed to play. But on Sundays, Karen could only play with her friends from church she had to sit in her own front yard and watch from across the street. Most adults liked her, certainly more than her own peers did. But Kate's parents refused to look her in the eye and dismissively froze her out when she tried to talk to them. She stepped up onto the curb of her own front lawn and slowed down. Here now was her own house. Empty, cold, dark, and sterile. Visions of the things she saw at night in the dark of that only child house suddenly bloomed in her mind. 
She remembered hearing the rolling, scraping squeak of the spinning wheel from the living room, hours after her parents had turned off all the lights and gone to bed. Did her parents hear it? It was loud enough to wake her up. They would just tell her it was a dream, but it didn't feel like a dream. She remembered being awake. There were secrets inside of dreams, secrets inside of the house. In the shifting purple, blue-black of night, these things sent sickening, chilly spasms through her stomach, and she lay in bed, staring out at the hallway, wishing she could open her mouth to scream for her mother, but then she would wake up and it would be morning. In the broad daylight of that summer afternoon, she felt nothing but peaked that could she get in her house, she would have the perfect opportunity to search for answers to these strange, wordless questions. That cabinet from her dreams, if she could just find it, it might reveal all, but she didn't have a house key. And then she turned and was off like a flash running up the street, disobeying everything she'd been taught by her mother. She ran hard up that street. She ran away from her best friend's angry outburst. She ran away from the visions of her lonely, overactive imagination. She ran away from her frustrating inability to make sense of the dreams that refused to stay locked inside the chimeras of the night. Why wouldn't they stay inside of her sleep? By the time she slowed down, she found herself on an unfamiliar street that felt far away from home. She'd never lived anywhere but this neighborhood, and she hadn't been running that long, but she'd managed to travel to a place that she did not know at all. The houses grew further and further apart as she walked, and then there were no houses, and the street became a potholed road. There was nothing but trees. Then there was a fork in the road, and there was a house. She stopped walking and stared. The trees, the bushes, the small fence, and the mailbox were all covered in flowers. She felt a soft, sweet breeze of cool autumn air and watched the petals of the flowers flutter. The house itself was plain, looked rather old and neglected. The front door opened, and a lady walked out. She was dressed all in shades of dark violet with an old-fashioned silhouette the little girl recognized from movies she'd watched with her mother, movies that reminded her mother of being a little girl, her daughter's age, going to the movies on Saturday morning, penny candy at the dime store afterwards, and playing outside in the neighborhood she grew up in, all the way out in that other valley, that inland valley, so far away and so long ago. She told her daughter stories of orange groves and plumbing factories and the railroad and wild nights racing through the trees under the moonlight with her best friend, the little girl next door, shrieking and running from the man who chased them until they were back in her own yard, shaking, trying to catch their breath, collapsing in a pool of golden light outside her own front door, safe at last. The lady in the long dress with the veiled hat carried a basket of flowers. She walked to a bush in the yard and began to twine the flowers through the branches. She performed this task for a few minutes, filling in the area quickly and neatly. Then she turned and looked out into the road, right at the little girl. The lady opened her mouth to speak, but instead of words, bird song. The little girl was not confused at all. She walked right up to the lady who extended her hand. She clasped it and they went inside of the house. She looked in wonder around her. The inside of this place did not match the outside at all. The foyer she stood and looked into a room filled with a riot of color and pattern everywhere. They turned down a hall and walked past other rooms until they found a pretty little kitchen this place reminded her of a dollhouse. The kitchen was full of old-fashioned curiosities, wooden presses that turned cookie dough into little houses, gaily painted ceramic flowers, teapots and colorful embroidered tea towels. The lady placed a book on the table in front of the little girl. She nodded at her, encouraging her to open it. She turned to the title page. The Tanglewood Tales, she read out loud. 
by Nathaniel Hawthorne. She turned to a bookmarked page and began to read. Once there was a little girl named Pandora who lived far out in the countryside with her mother. They had a herd of sheep and a large grove of olives. Her mother was old and her health was failing and Pandora worked hard to keep them fed and comfortable. Just as her mother had done for her when she was a child, so she did for her mother when her mother grew old. Like her mother had before her, Pandora now enjoyed her days of hard work among the placid animals and generous, fruitful trees. She treasured her quiet nights of simple, delicious food and warm companionship by the hearth while she worked the spinning wheel that had belonged to the women of her family for generations. The death of Pandora's mother came as no surprise when it happened. Both women had been preparing for death, and she saw to it that her mother went with peace and as much succor as one could provide to a loving parent. After all rituals and rites were most honorably completed, Pandora returned to their small cottage and sat alone at the hearth. It was a strange silence that filled the little home. Although she sat beside a warming fire, she felt cold. The cottage, once filled with convivial laughter, now felt horribly empty. Pandora wondered how to go about living her life alone in this cottage full of memories. There was work to be done. Sheep needed their shepherdess. The fruit of her trees must be harvested. Grief may have paralyzed her heart, but she was alive enough to know that grief must not paralyze her body. A few days later, a peddler came by the cottage. She went out to view his wares, and after she looked everything over and paid for her purchases, he told her he had something else for her as well. From the back of his caravan, he pulled down a smaller cart with two large cabinets on it, between which stood a magpie on a perch. The magpie stared at Pandora as the man pulled the cart toward her. This is your legacy. You must never open them, he said gravely. Why? she asked, puzzled. Who has left me this legacy? Is this from my mother? She never spoke of this. He did not answer her questions, but pulled a key and a small bag from his pocket and placed them on the cart in front of the large bird. With the gold in this bag, you will arrange to move all of your belongings to a house by the sea that has been left for you. That key will open the front gates. House by the sea, Pandora asked. What house is this? Where did this bird come from? Who sent you? He still did not answer her questions, but continued to speak. The bird will lead you to the house. Follow it. And then he looked at her closely, as though sizing her up. It is a peculiar house, he said. A grotesque house. You have dreamt of it many times. He turned back to the cart and began unloading the cabinets. You are charged with the task as part of your inheritance, he continued briskly. You must search the house for the two rooms furthest apart from each other and place one cabinet in each room. I will repeat my instructions once again. You must never open the cabinets and you must keep them apart. Do you understand? Yes, I understand, but who sent you, she pleaded with him. The man turned, closed the shutters on his caravan, secured his wares, and without a word to her, climbed back on board and drove off. She was left with the bird, the cabinets, the gold, and the key. She stood in front of her cottage and stared at her inheritance. The bird watched her closely. It would be a great deal of work to pack up and move her nice little life away. She did not know where this new home would be, how far away it was, nor did she know what kind of life might await her there. But her cottage was haunted by a lifetime of memories that left her struck dumb. She felt a dark, poisonous blossoming inside her chest every time she crossed its threshold a stupefying dolor of grief that frightened her. This legacy felt like the command of an Olympian, 
and obeying seemed the better part of wisdom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 